what are you saying, Lars? I still didn't hear you. The tape is on. Oh. Okay, my topic is contentment. Why is this amusing? <laughs> when I was preparing this talk, I had closets to organize, and I was overcome with nostalgia because the closets that I was going through contained all these old letters. My mother had saved every single letter that any one of her six children had ever read, written to her. She saved them all in individual boxes and all in chronological order. And so yesterday, uh, wherever I was yesterday morning, I can't remember, but I, I read uh, some of those letters, which I had never read my, since I wrote them in 1956 and 57, which were the crucial years following Jim's death. And my mother, of course, had kept all the letters. So I dredged up s some of those letters and it was amazing how many things were so completely forgotten that if I had, if anybody had asked me if they'd happened, I would have said no without lying because I had completely forgotten them anyway. So much about that. I, it was just such a nostalgic thing to be going through all this stuff and to realize these were the things that happened 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and here they are still in black and white in the box in my attic, in my closets. But I discovered also a staggering accumulation of keepsakes, which I needed to weed out. We have to be disciplined with things like that, too. And, of course, I have a family of ten who are my children. My daughter has eight children, so there's ten people there. And she had asked me on my last visit to help her organize her closets. And, of course, I was having a terrible time making any suggestions at all about what she could get rid of because you know how sentimental we can be about what little children do. <clears throat> the longings were indescribable, but if we're going to talk about contentment, let's begin with a command. Number one is a command. So for you note takers, there are going to be six topics here. <clears throat> The command in Psalm 131, 2 is, My soul is like a weaned child. I love the hymn, Be still, my soul. The Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change he faithful will remain. Well, my mother used to say to us, Behave yourself. That was a very common command that we heard over and over again. We were expected to behave ourselves. And contentment is really taking yourself by the scruff of the neck and behaving yourself when you're feeling discontented about anything. Just take, for example, the matter of air travel. I mean, it is just getting worse and worse and, you know, the planes are late and or they get canceled or they change the gate and all sorts of vicissitudes, things like that, that we have to deal with. The command is, be still, my soul. The Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief and pain. Psalm 131.2 says, my soul is as a weaned child. And you know the great calm that finally comes over the child, your baby, when the child is weaned. It's a great struggle toward the end. And then when the time finally comes, there's just such calm and such peace. <clears throat> Back in 1948, just before I graduated from college, Jim and I had fallen in love. Jim had confessed his love to me very shortly before I was to graduate. And it was then that we spent seven hours sitting in a park talking about the amazing way in which God had been leading each of us, unbeknownst to the other, through the same hymns, the same scriptures, even Amy Carmichael poems. You can imagine what it did to me to realize that his, this man, Jim Elliott, who was such a tough wrestler, was a fan of Amy Carmichael's and had actually memorized some of the same poems that I had memorized. 
And as we sat one evening, having committed our whole feelings for each other completely to God, and Jim had said, I love you. If God ever gives me the, the green light to be married, you're the woman that I would like to marry. But he said, I have absolutely no idea whether God wants me to be married or, be, or to be single. There are things that needs to be, need to be done by single men, which other missionaries had told him. And so he said, I'm not asking you to marry me. I'm not asking you to wait for me. You go ahead and go to Africa. He said, I'm not going to lay a finger on you because I have absolutely no rights over you. So one evening, a few days later, a few evenings later, we happened to, we were taking a walk and we wandered without even thinking, I don't think, into a cemetery. And we sat down on the stone slab and we were discussing the possibility as to whether or not it would be wise or unwise for us to carry on a correspondence. Jim had another year of college. I lived in New Jersey. He lived in Oregon. I was going to Africa. He was going to South America. And it didn't look as though there was any way that God would ever bring us together again. But we talked about the possibility of, of corresponding. And I said to Jim, uh, don't you think that's kind of like grasping to some, onto something, holding on to something which God really hasn't given us? If we're honest about this thing, leaving it totally in God's hands, wouldn't it just be best if we don't correspond? Well, it was a very long silence. Jim didn't leap at the suggestion, but he finally said, you're right, Bet." He said, the reason I know you're right is because this morning my reading in the Bible was on Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac. And Isaac was the most precious thing in Abraham's life, and so God told him to put him on the altar and so he said since you're the most precious thing in my life I've put you on the altar and that's where you're going to stay and unless God changes something which I can't predict at this moment and we sat in a long silence following that and suddenly we realized we were incidentally we were sitting at arm's length apart on this piece of lab because my mother had told me when I was 13 always keep the boys at arm's length <laughs> and never chase them so suddenly I realized that the moon had risen behind us and was casting the shadow of a stone cross between us a very loud and clear message which reminded me then of a poem that I had memorized of Amy Carmichael's. And shall I pray thee, change thy will, my father, until it be according unto mine? But no, Lord, no, that never shall be. Rather, I pray thee, blend my human will with thine. I pray thee, hush the hurrying, eager longing. I pray thee, soothe the pangs of keen desire. See in my quiet places wishes thronging. Forbid them, Lord, purge, though it be with fire, and work in me to will and do thy pleasure, till all within me peaceful reconciled, tarry content, my well-beloved's leisure, at last, at last even as a weaned child. The command is be still. Number two is teachability which I think is a good definition of the word meekness. We very often confuse the word meekness with weakness. Nothing could be further from the truth. But meekness is teachability. Moses was the meekest man that ever lived, the Bible says. But I think of Moses as a very powerful man and the man on whom God laid his hand to take care of those recalcitrant Israelites that made him so angry that he said to the Lord, do I have to bear these people in my bosom am I their mother or they make me so mad I just want to kill them and do how long do I have to keep on doing this and he did it of course up to the end of his life teachability so I want to ask you are you teachable if you're going to learn contentment you're going to have to be teachable are you teachable from some sources but not from others you're willing to sit and listen to K but you might not want to listen to your boss or you might not want to listen to that person who is correcting you about something or your husband or your friend or whatever and God sometimes assigns to us very strange counselors 
who have a word directly from God, but we're not meek enough to receive it from that person. What about your husband? Are you content to receive God's message for, from him? Let's look at Philippians 4, 11 to 13. Paul says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And where was Paul when he wrote this? In prison, probably chained 24 hours a day between two guards. Can you think of a more horrible situation? Maybe there were rats there, wouldn't be surprised. It was cold, miserable, or maybe terribly hot, who knows. But at any, any rate, it was the last place that one would expect to be content. And Paul said, I have learned. He was teachable. He was meek. I love this little book, Daily Strength for Daily Needs, and I strongly recommend it. It's one of the very best devotional books I know, and it's been around for a hundred years or more. There's an unbelievable avalanche of uh, devotional books that are coming off the presses constantly. I wouldn't run after them too fast if I were you. I would stick with the really old ones, and there's nothing that, that beats this one. Uh, Mary Wilder Tileston must have been an incredibly well-read lady because she put these together and there's another one called Joy and Strength so if you can't find Daily Strength for Daily Needs very likely you can find Joy and Strength they're both in print I believe but for May the 23rd this is what she wrote, she includes and it's all it's not her writing she has gleaned from dozens if not hundreds of writers this is from a, a 19th century Anglican priest whose name was E.B. Pusey. If we wish to gain contentment, we might try such rules as these and prepare yourself for tough rules. Number one, allow yourself to complain of nothing, not even the weather. Do you want to gain contentment? Okay. R rule one, complain of nothing, not even the weather. Number two, never picture your thyself to thyself under any circumstances in which thou art not. What? Somebody said. <laughs> Never picture to yourself any circumstances in which you aren't. In other words, if you oh, if only I lived over there, if only I had so-and-so's figure, if only I had so-and-so's husband, if only the Lord would give me a better job. These are ways in which we picture to ourselves all sorts of, all sorts of imaginary situations which we think would make us happy. Never do it. Never picture to yourself anything, any circumstance in which you are not. Number three, never compare your lot with that of anybody else. If only I had her looks. If only I could do what she does. Wouldn't I love to be able to play the piano like this wonderful woman? Number four, never allow yourself to dwell on the wish that this or that had been or were otherwise than it was. Never allow yourself to dwell on a wish that something had been other than what it was. God Almighty loves thee better and more wisely than thou dost thyself. Don't dwell on fruitless wishes if you want a short version. Number five, never dwell on tomorrow. Remember that it is God's, not yours. The heaviest part of sorrow often is to look forward to it. You know, we think of all the horrible things that might happen tomorrow or next week or six months from now. That is absolutely none of our business. Our business is today. What is God saying to you today? Where are you today? What are you doing today? What are you receiving from him today? Are you, are you being teachable? So don't dwell on tomorrow. God is already there. That, to me, is a very comforting thought. God is already there. There is no future to God. There's no past and no present. The whole thing belongs to him. And I was strongly tempted to think constantly about what was going to happen tomorrow, what the doctors were going to do to my poor second husband when he was dying of cancer, 
I could, I could get through today because there he was in the bed, but if the doctors were going to do the hideous, horrible things that they were talking about doing before he died, I thought, I can't stand it. And I began then to learn to take one day at a time. Okay, number one, don't complain. Number two, don't picture yourself. Number three, don't compare. Number four, don't allow yourself to dwell. Number five, don't dwell on tomorrow. <coughs> so if you can learn all the lessons there, you will begin to be teachable. Number five, number three, now point three, we're in. Number one was a command. Number two is teachability. Number three is trust. Hebrews 13, 5 says, be content with such things as you have. That's a command. We are to trust that God does know what he's doing. He, we have a father who is faithful. He is forgiving. He is our fortress. There's a list of F's here. Father, faithful, forgiving, fortress, friend. And he is our helper. Do you believe that? That's trust. We cannot possibly be contented without trusting that God does know what he's doing. And he's got the whole world in his hands and nothing slips through his fingers and everything that he does has a purpose. Psalm 16.5 is one of my life verses. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup and have made my lot secure. Isn't it a calm peaceful sense that we have when we realize that it's God who has assigned us our portion. The exact number of days, hours, minutes that you're going to live, it is already assigned by God, but it's not your business. You leave that with God, content to know that God's timing is perfect. You have assigned me my portion and my cup and have made my lot secure. Psalm 17, 14 says, Save me from men of this world whose reward is in this life. You don't need to try to write out all these things when I give you a scripture reference. That's enough. You can look it up. He satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry with good things. Do you believe that? Does he really satisfy your longing soul. Jeremy Taylor, a writer of the 16th century, said, Is that beast better that hath two or three mountains to graze on than a little bee that feeds on dew or manna and lives upon what falls every morning from the storehouse of heaven? Is the beast, the animal that has two or three whole mountains to graze on, is he really happier than the little bee who feeds on dew and manna and lives upon what falls every morning from heaven? We have a loving Heavenly Father who cares for us. My father was a great bird man. He was a bird watcher before anybody came up with that t term. He, when he was 16 years old, my father used to go out in the forest around Philadelphia, and he would stand perfectly still for sometimes long minutes or even hours with his hands behind his back and listen and watch. And my father taught that to all of us, how I thank God for the father that I had. He was an editor. He was a very fine writer, but he never wrote a book. He spent his life writing other, reading other people's stuff and he was the editor of a Christian magazine, but he taught us observation, taught us to listen and see things. You know, the average person really doesn't notice much. And as he stood there in the, in the woods, he began, he began to hear these different bird calls, and he noticed that there were so many different bird, bird calls. And then he began to imitate them. And my father could imitate to perfection 60 different species of birds. And he gave to each one of his children a bird call. So he didn't call me by my name if I was in another room. He called me by the bird whose name he had given me. It was the wood peewee. And, 
I wish I could do it exactly the way he did. He had a perfect clarity, and he could get much higher than anybody else that I've ever heard that could whistle. But the wood peewee goes more or less like this. And that's all I would have to hear, and of course I would come. And one time, and my father's uh, bird call for my mother was the little chickadee. And my mother's reply was, she couldn't whistle, so she did it through her teeth like that. But every day when my father came home from work, we would hear the squeak of the door when he turned the handle. And the next thing we would hear was his chickadee call of my mother. And we would hear her less than perfect call from the kitchen. <laughs> but he was asked to lecture on birds, and he would travel around and give lectures here and there. And very often he would go to public schools and talk to children. But whoever he was talking to, he would always end his lecture, with, which was always illustrated with colored slides in those days. He would show the bird, and then he would tell the bird's habits, and he would give these wonderful calls. And I have tapes of my father's bird calls. And he would always end with these words, said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Contentment. And Lars and I love watching the birds. We live right on the coast of Massachusetts. Very quiet place. We live in a cul-de-sac. We have a sea in front of us. We have beautiful red rocks, very similar to Carmel area. And we have birds, and we sit and watch them, and we think of the marvels of the different designs of their nests and the ways in which the father takes care of the mother when she's sitting the eggs and feeds her. I watched a house sparrow feed his five babies. We were, I was within six inches of the nest because they had built a nest in our windowsill. And I watched the father bird feed five babies, each one of them 11 times on one trip. Now that's 55 mouthfuls. And Lars, wise man, he said obviously he couldn't have had 55 ma mouthfuls in that tiny little beak. He's e regurgitating. And so he's feeding each of these little birds. But these wonderful things, there was total contentment. The birds, of course, were always, you know, their little heads are poked up like this and their mouths are bigger than anything else in the whole bird. And here's this father. And he didn't go in the same order. I watched that. He wasn't going all around the circle. He went from here to here to here to here. But each one of them got exactly five or 11 mouthfuls. Well, that's our Heavenly Father. Is that beast better that has two or three mountains to graze on than the little bee? Your Heavenly Father knows what you need. Somebody here may need a house, and you've been looking all over the place, you haven't been able to find one. Trust God for the timing. Trust him for the location, for the size, for the price. And we say, what are we going to do? But he himself knows what he will do. That's what the Bible says. You know, God is not worried about anything. Have you ever thought about that? He is not worried about anything. No matter what is happening, there are many things that God does not like, but he's not worried. And the Bible says, do not worry about anything, whatever. It is a sin. It is a command. Do not worry. Okay, number four, if we're going to be content, how much is enough? Ask yourself. Your attitude toward your earthly possessions. Are they always more than you have? You always want something more than what you have. Numbers 11, verses 1 to 6. The people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord, and when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. And when the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So that place was called Taberah, because fire from the Lord had burned among them. 
And then what happened? The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. And they got so sick and tired of manna. They wanted the leeks and onions and garlic and watermelons and fish and all the stuff that they had back in Egypt. And they complained. Well, are we very different? How much is enough? Do you have a complaining spirit? Have you recognized that the Lord is your portion and the Lord assigns your portion? Psalm 16, 5 again, Lord, you have assigned me my portion. When Jim died after 27 months, I didn't think that I had had a big enough portion of life with Jim Elliott after waiting five and a half years. But who assigned it? It wasn't any of my business. What about the clutter in your house? Now I know I quit preaching and I go on to meddling. <laughs> clutter, I can't stand it. I don't know how people live in a house full of clutter. I want to know exactly where everything is and I want it in its place. And you're going to go out of here saying, that woman needs professional counseling. <laughs> Now, why do you have all this clutter? Is it because you don't know what to do with it? Or because you're sentimental about it? Or because you just don't get around to it? You do get around to watching the videos you want to watch, and you do get around to looking at the catalogs and going to the mall and a whole lot of other things that you think are fun. But you don't get around to organizing your life. How much is enough? My husband and I are challenged daily because we have a 45-year-old bachelor who lives with us. And he is a man that nobody can convince has enough. We can never convince him. And his talk about clutter, it's just unbelievable. We found out that he had about 100 plastic grocery bags in his room. And I, I said, why? And he said, well, I never know when I might run out. Well, I said, if you run out of plastic grocery bags, you come and ask me, I'll give you one. <laughs> well, usually the problem is the refusal to make decisions. I do save t twistums, you know, those little wire things. But I don't save a hundred twistums. I always want to make sure that I have three or four in the drawer because I'm not going to go out and buy Twistums. To me, that's absolutely ridiculous. And, you know, what Lars said, he and I grew up in back of those tough days during World War II, and we didn't throw things away. We saved things that needed to be saved. But ask yourself, before God, in the presence of God, am I refusing to make decisions? Am I refusing to make reasonable estimates? This is what we've told our lodger. You have to make a reasonable estimate of how many plastic bags you need. I mean, it'd be stupid to throw them all away if you're going to need a plastic bag, but how about you don't need a hundred. A lady, one of my radio listeners sent me this little song. She wrote the words to three blind mice. Too much stuff, too much stuff. More than enough, more than enough. It's out of the closets and filling our space. It's grow it's spilling, it's growing and spilling all over the place. We're tripping all over a terrible case of too much stuff. <laughs> too much stuff. That's not the end. Second verse. The piles are staring us in the face. They multiply at an alarming race. And soon we'll be buried without a trace <laughs> in too much stuff. It isn't easy to run the race with all of this stuff slowing down the pace. I think that I need some additional grace for too much stuff. And then she wrote also dishes, dishes, dirty dishes. I do dishes all day long. Seems I'm always washing dishes, so I sing this little song. <laughs> Thank you, God, for dirty dishes for our food and family. Help me see each dirty dish as one more blessing given me.
And I will give you this. If anybody wants to Xerox this, why well, you can look at this, but I need to have it back, okay? <clears throat> There's a beautiful hymn by John Greenleaf Whittier. It begins with the words, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. But it has this lovely stanza, which is one of the watchwords of my life. Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our strivings cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. And I thank God for a mother and father who taught us that. We had an ordered life. Six kids in the family, it was a peaceful, ordered, always neat home. Now, when I say always neat, that doesn't mean that we kids didn't leave skates on the front porch at times and something on the stairs, and, but we certainly heard about it when we did, and there was a place for everything, and everything was supposed to be in its place. So if you don't have a place for everything, that's your fault. That's not your children's fault. But if you have a place for everything, then the children have to know where that is. And back in the days before scotch tape, can you imagine that we lived without scotch tape? But we had something called mending tape. It had to be in a certain place in the kitchen drawer. And if the mending tape was not in that place in the kitchen drawer, it was the fault of one of us kids. It was not the fault of our parents. And so we had to find that piece of tape and put it where it belonged. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Luke 12, 15 says, A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things that he possesseth. Lars and I spend our time constantly weeding out, getting rid of, giving away things that would clutter our lives. Number five now, point five. Number four was how much is enough. Number five is acceptance. This whole subject is a spiritual one, ladies. I wouldn't want to waste your time if it was not a spiritual ma matter, because everything is an affair of the spirit. Everything. Acceptance. Do you have a cheerful, thankful spirit for what God has given you? The Bible says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. That's a tough one, isn't it? In everything give thanks. My friend, Nay Bailey, was in Poland. She was in a train station carrying a very big suitcase and a couple of handbags, and two very nicely dressed young men came rushing up to her and said, could we help you put the suitcase on the train? And she was very grateful. They put the suitcase on the train. They jumped off the train, and the train started off, whereupon she realized that they had rifled her hand baggage. She had lost her passport, her checks, her money, her credit cards. And she said, I sat down and I said, Lord, I don't know what you're going to do about this, but I am going to thank you for what has just happened. Obviously, humanly speaking, there was absolutely no way that she could go anywhere in Poland without those things. Well, she got off at the next stop. She went to the police station, told them what had happened. They smiled knowingly. They said, yes, it happens every day. It's a classic sting operation. And she said, I just want you to know that I have asked the Lord to enable me to get back whatever he thinks I need back. So just so you know that I have prayed about this. And of course, they smiled sardonically and said, well, we've never heard of anybody getting anything back, but uh, thank you for telling us. And everywhere she went, she went to the American Express place and she went to the bank and went to all the places she could go where she could hope to find that someone had turned something in and can you believe she got back everything except sixty dollars in American cash now the Lord doesn't necessarily do that for you and me does he but he can the key though was saying thanks instead of just getting frantic and paranoid and falling into a pile of self-pity. Thank you, Lord. You knew this was going to happen. I leave it with you. Peace. Willingness to receive what God appoints. 
when thou hast asked thy God, when thou hast thanked thy God for every blessing sent, what time will then remain for murmurs or lament? When thou hast thanked thy God for every blessing sent, that's going to take you a long time, isn't it? What time will then remain for murmurs or lament? Is your normal response to God, yes, Lord, behold the handmaiden of the Lord, your Father knows, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Think of the memories, the wishes, the regrets, the losses. These are the givens of your life. The Lord is asking you, what are you going to do with these things? Leave them to me? Trust me for them? Thank me for them? Or what? And one more quotation from this same little devotional book, Daily Strength for Daily Needs. This is the only source given is poor Methodist woman of the 18th century. The name is not here. I do not know when I have had happier times in my soul than when I have been sitting at work with nothing before me but a candle and a white cloth and hearing no sound but that of my own breath with God in my soul and heaven in my eye. I rejoice in being exactly what I am, a creature capable of loving God and who as long as God lives must be happy. I get up and look for a while out the window and gaze at the moon and stars, the work of an almighty hand. I think of the grandeur of the universe and then sit down and think myself one of the happiest beings in it. A poor Methodist woman of the 18th century. And when you come up against something that you just think is completely beyond you're dealing with, does it occur to you to say what Jesus said on the cross, Father, into thy hands? I say this over and over again. I say, Lord, I can't handle this, whatever it is. So what do I do? Father, into thy hands. Lord, you can handle this. I can't. I give it to you. Acceptance brings peace. That's the great lesson that Amy Carmichael rings the changes on. It came to me as soon as I knew that my husband Jim was dead. Those wonderful words, in acceptance lieth peace. Number six now, this is the last, love, joy, and peace. In order to learn tranquility, we're going to have to, we will, the results are going to be love, joy, and peace. Simplicity goes along with tranquility. I was talking with Kathy this morning about the way Lars and I pack. We don't want to lug a whole lot of stuff around with us. So over these 20 years that we've been traveling together, uh, we've learned a few things, and one, one of which is you really don't need very many outfits. And nobody gives two hoots what you were wearing yesterday. You know, we, wise, we women are so vain. We think, oh, well, I can't wear the same thing today because everybody would notice. Who in the world do you think cares? <laughs> Where did you ever get this idea? Now you may say, well, I know you didn't have that blouse on yesterday. And that's fine. Of course I didn't. But I'm not going to tell you how few things I have in my suitcase. Simplicity. Tranquility. I want to own less. I want to talk less. I want to be, I don't want to be a busybody encumbering myself with matters that have never been assigned to me. And that certainly is a temptation for a lot of us women to be busybodies in things that are absolutely none of our business. And you know, finally, in the grace of God and in his great mercy, all these seven decades and more, I really do think that he's gotten across to me the idea that there are very few things that are my business. Very few things. It's a good thing to ponder. How many things are really your business? We're always making odious comparisons. Comparing ourselves with other people, comparing other people with other people. 
And Jesus said, My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. It's a beautiful hymn. In heavenly love abiding, no change my heart can fear, for safe is such confiding, and nothing changes here. The storm may rage about me, my heart may low be laid, but God is round about me, and shall I be dismayed? Wherever he may guide me, no want shall turn me back. My shepherd is beside me, and nothing can I lack. His wisdom ever waketh, his sight is never dim. He knows the way he taketh, and I will walk with him. There will be no disappointments if my will is buried and surrendered in the will of God. I will find true, godly, simple contentment. And it's what I earnestly long for for each one of you. I think it's a very rare quality in women to be able to say, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of how many of you think you've learned that lesson, but take it to the Lord in prayer. Ask him. Remember, number one is a command. It is obedience. Number two is teachability. Number three is trust. How can I be contented unless I trust God for the way he has apportioned my cup? Number four, how much is enough? Honestly now, how much is enough? Maybe you need to go home and take a walk through your house and ask that question in every room. Number five, acceptance. Number six, love, joy, and peace. These will be the results. May God make us faithful. Let's pray. Gracious, loving Father, you are so long-suffering with us. You have told us over and over and over again the ways to peace and fulfillment and joy. But we are such slow learners. Thank you, Father, for your patience with us for your love, for your endless teaching. And we ask that you will give us that spirit of meekness. We thank you for the invitation that you gave. Come to me, you who are tired and overburdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. May we find that rest in you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.